like an ocean I've been playing on the shore Now I'm diving in because I want to know you more You are like a mountain I've been camping at the base Now I'm heading to the top I want to see your face I want more Give me more More of you Lord, I open my mind and my heart To receive all you give I want more Give me more More of you And may this holy quest Be my passion The reason I live I want more 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 of you Is that your heart cry? You want more of him? Are you satisfied with just a little bit? I want to talk to you today about a practice that has gone out of vogue, out of popularity in the Christian church today, at least in large part within the Christian church today. And for many of us, when we think about this, we think that, that this particular practice is relegated to somebody who is like living in a, in a monastery or, or, or somewhere like that, where, where, they, where they contemplate God 24-7, 365, but for all of us outside of that setting, the truth is, is that we don't have time. We don't have time for that in our lives. The title of my sermon is Fasting, When, Not If. I think you'll figure that out as we go. The text for today is Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. It says this, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint 
your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. As we look at the book of Acts, and as we study the book of Acts in the first church, one of the things we discover is that those who were the early followers of Jesus Christ experienced something that is lacking, I think, in the lives of many of us in the church today. And that is that, that power and presence of the Holy Spirit. One of the things is, is for certain is that I can promise you, and you can check it out in Scripture, don't take my word for it, but the early disciples spent time, yes, in prayer, but they also spent time fasting. But it isn't just the New Testament church. It's throughout the entire Bible. And so I, I want us to realize that fasting is not a choice, kind of like, you know, when you go to a, when you go to a, a Golden Corral, you know, and they have all of this food out there, and you say, well, I, I'm going to have some of this over here, but I don't really particularly care for this over here, and I don't really like that over there, but I'm going to get some more of that because that's really good. You know, and sometimes we approach our Christianity that same way. And we say, God, I, I really like this, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really get a lot out of that. I'm going to receive that, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to participate in that. But this thing over here, this thing called fasting, I, that's not my game. That's not God. You haven't called me to fast. Well, I will tell you that if you're a Christian, God has called you to, to fast. I don't know if you have a red letter edition. But I believe that if you read these words in your Bible and they're in red, that means that Jesus is speaking them. And he doesn't say to us when. He said, if you fast, he says, when you fast. Okay, those two little words change Jesus Christ's intent for you and for me. You see, the first point that I want to make about fasting is that it's required. It is absolutely required. Fasting is an expected discipline in both the Old and the New Testament. And yes, it's an expected discipline in the church today. If we look at the Old Testament, Moses fasted at least, at least two times. He fasted for a 40-day period. Now, if you study it, and I went back and read this to make sure that I was right about this. He, he, he went up on the mountain to be with God, and he fasted for 40 days. And, and this was a supernatural fast, because it says he neither ate, well, let's look at it. This is it. It's in Deuteronomy 9, 18. These are Moses' own words. He said, Then I lay prostrate before the Lord as before, 40 days and 40 nights, I neither ate bread nor drank water. Can I just say this? You and I cannot fast from bread and water for 40 days. We can fast from food for 40 days, but you can't fast from water more than a couple of days. Maybe three at the most. And then your body's going to start shutting down. So we know that Moses was in the presence of God, okay, and it says that he fasted for 40 days. But here is the interesting thing. It said he neither ate nor drank anything. And then he came down the mountain with these tablets and saw the people worshiping the golden calf. And he broke the tablets in anger. He threw them down and they were broken. And then he went up on the mountain and guess what? It doesn't say he stopped to eat lunch or dinner. It says he went back up on the mountain and he was with God again for 40 days. He went 80 days without food or water. Now, again, spiritual, it's a physical impossibility for you and for me, okay? Having said that, that doesn't negate the requirement for us as Christians to fast periodically. Now, it doesn't give us a timetable for this, 
Okay? You need to understand that, it, that the Bible nowhere tells you how long you need to fast. But fasting was a regular part of the Old and the New Testament. We know that Jesus fasted in the wilderness for 40 days. <clears throat> and, and remember he says, when he, when he reminded his followers to fast, he said, when you fast, not if you fast. You see, fasting, I believe, is a way to demonstrate to God and to ourselves that we're really serious, that we're genuinely serious about our relationship with Him. And, and I believe that fasting helps us gain a new perspective and a renewed reliance upon God. We're going to look at some other things here about fasting that I think are important. The second thing that I want you to see is that fasting restores our first love. I believe that fasting and prayer can restore our first love. Now, you're saying, Pastor, what are you talking about? What do you mean, my first love? My first love was my, you know, my childhood sweetheart. When I, was in, when I was in junior high school. No, that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about restoring that relationship. We're talking about the first love that you had for Christ. Yes. In the book of, of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 4, <clears throat> it says this, talking about one of the churches uh, that, that was being uh, spoken to and against. He says, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. And if I might parenthetically add, the love you had for me at first. I want everybody to close your eyes for just a minute. And when I want everybody to do this, I know a lot of you don't like to be in a room with a bunch of other people with your eyes closed. But I want you to do this, if you would, just to indulge me here for a second. I want you to think back to the time when you first came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want you to capture that feeling. Try to try to try to regather your thoughts about that and kind of capture that that feeling. Now open your eyes. That's your first love. That feeling, the thing that you felt back then, is what Jesus is talking about here. Your first love. And I believe that fasting is a way to get back to. That, that feeling, that, that sense of the very presence of God that Moses experienced for 80 days upon the mountain, that we can experience that same kind of closeness with God. And I believe that if we were to follow through with, with, a, with this fasting, that it would result, I believe, in a more intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Now... That, that video we watched at the beginning talked about more of you. Is that something you're interested in? Because if it is, then fasting is a way to get there. Fasting is a way to get from where you are to where you want to be with God. The third thing that, that I see here is that fasting results in humility. But you've got to be careful here because... Jesus warns us that fasting isn't something that we do for our show. Fasting is not something that you do so people will look at you and say, look at how spiritual he is or she is because, you know, he sent out a Facebook message that he's going to be fasting for the next 40 days. So, you know, how spiritual is he or she? What does he say here? He says, back in that verse, he says that... Um, that don't be like the hypocrites. That's what he says. When you fast, it says anoint your head, wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting. But to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Okay? So the, the idea here is, is that you learn to, to humble yourselves when you fast. You don't make an outward show of this. This is between you and God. It's between you and God. I had never fasted before. 
But when I was stationed at Fort Leavenworth, I was challenged by my friend, Steve Pastel, who was there with me, to fast. And I fasted the first time for three days. It was hard. It was very hard. I happened to, one of my hobbies is eating. <laughs> so for me to fast for three days was hard. <clears throat> and by the end of the third day, I was really struggling. Physically, I was struggling. I was in a lot of pain. My body was reacting to the lack of food. Then, then my friend challenged me to do 10 days. And I will tell you, after day three, not so bad through 10 days. So then he said, it wasn't like the day after this, but this was after a period of time, he said, how about you and I together, just the two of us, covenant to fast together and support each other for 40 days. 40 days. It's in the Bible. Now, I will tell you that, that we did not completely give up nourishment. Okay? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be open with you. We refrained from eating solid food for 40 days. We drank vegetable juices and fruit juices, and I allowed myself to have coffee. But that was it. Only liquids, and, and that's all for 40 days. And you say, how did you do it? And I will tell you that, again, after day three, it becomes easy. It becomes very easy to do that. Now, I would not recommend doing it for more than 40 days. But let me tell you what happened during that 40-day period. And the reason that you fast is not just so you can later on, you know, tell war stories about how you fasted, okay? That's not the point of fasting. Let me tell you what happened during that time. It was during that 40-day fast that God gave the vision for Living Waters Community Church. Because what I had done, and I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you the facts. What I had done is that I had, that I had let go of something that was very important to me, something that I enjoyed very much, in order to hear from God. In order to hear what God had to say to me. And, and, and if I could just say this, um, it, 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 it revolutionized my spiritual horizon. Let me explain what that means. I began to see things with my spiritual eyes that God I had never seen before. God began to reveal things to me through my spiritual eyes that I had never seen, that I had never experienced spiritually in my entire life. And I will tell you that, that it was an amazing experience. So much so that I decided that we, my friend and I, decided that we were going to do this every year. And so for two or three more years after that, we, even though he moved away and we were separated by distance and by space, um, we agreed to do that. And I will tell you that each time that I engaged in this spiritual fast, and that's what it was, it was a spiritual fast, that each time I was engaged in this spiritual fast, God revealed something to me new and drew me closer to Him. And my relationship with Him was, great, was greater than it had ever been. Because when you fast, you are, you are saying to God, God, I'm willing to do without this, and I'm willing to humble myself in order to hear what you have to say to me. It's a biblical way to humble yourself in the sight of God. Psalm 35, 13 tells us how King David 
humbled himself by fasting. He said, yet when they were ill, I put on sackcloth and humbled myself with fasting. When my prayers returned to me unanswered. Have you ever been in that situation where you seem like you're praying and it seems like the prayers aren't getting beyond the ceiling? Try doing some fasting and praying and see what happens. In the book of Ezra, in Ezra 8.21 we read, There by the Ahava Canal I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask Him for a safe journey for us and our children with all of our possessions. Look, are you getting ready to do something powerful? Uh, something that's scary? Something that's a little unnerving? I would recommend that before you do it, that you fast and pray. That you humble yourself by fasting and by praying. And see what God does for you during that time. The fourth thing that I see here is that, 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 that fasting reveals your spiritual condition. You see, fasting enables the Holy Spirit to reveal who you are spiritually. And what is the end result in that? The end result is this. It's brokenness and repentance and a transformed life. Let me explain to you why this is. And I'm going to go back to an Old Testament illustration of this. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah came into the presence of God. It says, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And there's a whole description of what happened there as we read that. And he was in the very presence of God during that time. And here's what happened. He saw the majesty of how glorious, how beautiful, how marvelous. We just sang those words about God. He was. And he saw who he was. And he said, woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among a people of unclean lips. When we come to God <coughs> fasting, he begins to open up our eyes to who we are. He opens up our eyes to who He is, and we cannot help but see who we are when we compare ourselves to Him. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. So fasting gives us a way to see who we are in relation to who God is. And I believe that when we fast, the Holy Spirit quickens the Word of God in our hearts, and His truths become even more powerful and more meaningful to us. We, we saw it on the video at the beginning in James 4.8. Some of you ladies are memorizing um, James. So this is it. If you want to repeat it because you've memorized it, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinner, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Fasting is a way to draw near to God. Fasting is one way that we can get closer to God. You want God to be closer to you, God has never moved. Remember I had you close your eyes a minute ago and you, and, and you thought back to that moment when Jesus Christ became your Savior? And you say, well, I don't feel that close to Him now. Guess who moved? God didn't go anywhere. God is still God. God is still the Creator of the universe. He is, he is all-knowing, all-seeing. He's everywhere all the time. He's here yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So if you don't feel close to God, guess who moved? Fasting is a way to draw close to God. Number five, I love this. Fasting revolutionizes your prayer life. You want to have a more meaningful experience with God in your prayer life. Fast and pray. Fasting will revolution, literally revolutionize your praying. Because what happens is that we align ourselves with God's Spirit. You see, God's Spirit dwells in each one of us. Not one of us 
who calls themselves a Christian, who has accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, not one of us is ever far from God because God's Spirit dwells within us. Okay? Now, you say, but I've never seen him. <laughs> well, you can't see him. Get, you do an MRI of your entire body, the Holy Spirit will not be in there. Okay? But he is present with you. He is there in, with your spirit. He is abiding inside of you. And because of that, then the Holy Spirit is the one that quickens, that quickens you to see God's word. And, 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 and when we pray, it opens your spiritual eyes for God to show you those amazing things. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says this. <coughs> It says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. I will tell you that when you fast, you get a sense that your outer body is wasting away a little bit. And in fact, in fact, you will very likely lose weight. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that you do a spiritual fast to lose weight. But if you don't eat for 40 days... A natural outcropping of that is that your body will begin to diminish, but your spiritual life will flourish. Your spiritual life will grow exponentially. And God will reveal to you through spiritual eyes, and He will show you some great and marvelous things. I believe that we get a glimpse of this from the Apostle Paul, who talked about being out of, it's almost like he's describing an out-of-body experience. And I will tell you that in a sense, fasting gives you that same kind of feeling. It's almost like an out-of-body experience. The last thing that I, that I would say is that fasting, when you fast, revival comes easier. Revival comes easier. Fasting can result in a dynamic, personal revival in your own life. Not only will it do that, but I believe that fasting then will make you a channel of revival for others. God will use you to encourage others to revival. Fasting and prayer are the only disciplines that I see in the Bible that fulfill the requirements of 2 Chronicles 7.14 that says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, how do we humble ourselves? Fasting is a way of humbling ourselves and pray and seeking God's face. I want to stop there for a second. Leave that up, Brother Wayne, if you would. I want to stop there because this is the problem for many of us. This is, this, is, this is the biggest hurdle that many of us need to overcome is we are real happy on what God wants to give us. We are real anxious to see what God's going to do for us. We're all about what God, how God can bless us. But what we're doing when those are our end goals is that we're simply seeking God's hand. But God has not called us to seek His hand. He's called us to seek His face. That's what this verse says. We need to seek His face. What does that mean? It means all of these things that God can do for me and all the things that God can give me, if He were to take it all away, I would still love Him because what I desire is not what He can give me, not what I can get out of Him, not what I can squeeze out of Him through my my sophisticated praying, but rather what, what, I can, what I can experience whenever I forget about the things of this world and focus on God, seeking His face. So if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, fasting is a way to do that, and pray and seek my face, a natural outcropping of that is that you're going to turn from your wicked ways. You can't do all of those other things and continue to serve sin, to be involved in sin. You're going to have, you're going to have a transformation take place in your life when you do those. He says, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal 
their land. Revival comes to those who are willing to humble themselves through fasting. I started out by saying that this is, this is a practice that has gone out of popularity in the modern church. But I need to, I need to modify that a little bit. It is, a, it is a practice that has gone away in the church in the United States. Let me tell you where people are still fasting regularly. They're fasting every place where persecution of people because of their faith is taking place. You go to the underground church in China and you'll discover people who are fasting and pray on a regular basis. You find Christians in North Korea, probably more oppressive than China, and they're fasting and praying. You go to the Middle East where Christianity, just being, just, just converting to Christianity is enough reason for you to die, and you'll find people that are fasting and praying. See, the problem is, is that we've gotten so comfortable with our life here. We've gotten so comfortable with our lifestyle here in the United States. We live in a, in a, in a, a country of abundance of wealth. The poorest person that you know is richer than 85% of the rest of the world. Think about that. When we were in Uganda last year, I learned that the average income per year, her family, not per person, her family, is about $400. How many poor people you know that get more than $400? Most of them. Even homeless people can somehow come up with more than $400. But we have, we have become so comfortable in our lifestyle that we feel like that we don't need to do all of these things. Instead, what we do is we come to church on Sunday and we get our ticket punched and then we go do our own thing the rest of the week. And then we come back again on Sunday so we can get our ticket punched again. That's the reason that we look around and there are chairs that are vacant. My brother has been appealing. My brothers have been appealing to folks to do evangelism. How many did you have in your class today, brother? Zero. How to share Jesus without fear. You're a Christian. Wouldn't you like to know how to share Jesus without being afraid to share Jesus? Nobody came to his class today. There's a term for this. It's called apathy. It's apathy. I'll go to church if I don't have something better to do. I'm not going to do it, but I would just like to call the people that are not here today. You know who they are. You, you know who's not here. And ask them, what were you doing? Now, if they're sick, maybe you shouldn't come if you're contagious. But if you're sick and you're not contagious, what better place to be than in church? You might just get healed. But we use that as an excuse. Or... What's going on right now in sports? March Madness. I bet you there are people that are staying home to watch basketball today. What does that say, you know? Is that sinful? I don't know if that's sinful. But what does it say about your relationship to God if that you can think of anything? You know, people say, well, Pastor, I couldn't come. The weather was just too cold. And then I hear the excuse, it was such a beautiful day. I just felt like we just needed to get out on the lake for a little while. You know, any excuse will do. The reality is, is that God has called us above everything else to draw close to Him. And yet, we draw close to so many other things in our lives that have nothing to do with Him. We spend all of our energy and all of our time doing all of these things that bring us a momentary comfort, 
a momentary pleasure, a momentary joy when God is saying, I've got so much more to offer you than what this world has to offer you. Compared to what God has to offer you, what the world has is mere crumbs that have fallen from the table. And yet, we scramble like animals to lick up those crumbs, rejecting the feast that God has prepared for us. You say, well, that's kind of an odd analogy to use when you're talking about fasting. I'm not talking about physical food. I'm talking about spiritual food. I'm talking about what God has prepared for those whose hearts have drawn close to Him. That's what I'm talking about. And what God has prepared for you is far more delicious, far more marvelous, far more savory, far more glorious than anything this world can place on the table. If you fast, you're going to find yourself becoming humbled before God. You're going to discover that by giving up your meals, you have more time to pray, and you have more time to be in the Word, and you have more time to commune with God and to seek God's face. And as He leads you through your prayer and through your fasting, He will lead you to recognize and repent of any unconfessed sin. And you will experience a closeness to God that you have never experienced before in your life outside of fasting. The Word says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Are you ready to experience all that God has for you, then I invite you to begin the practice of fasting.